Declan de Poor. Declan uh, grew up in Ireland, but uh, at some point in his career moved to the East Coast of the US and has taught in a number of schools throughout Massachusetts and the East Coast. He's currently a uh, research professor at um, Old Dominion University. Uh, he's interested in the area of geophysics. In particular, he wants to be able to visualize stuff on the ground, which means Google Earth isn't an overly useful tool for him in some ways. However, rather than complaining about this fact, he's actually gone out and done something about it. Um, so using Google Earth in combination with SketchUp, he's found weird and wonderful ways to bring those visualizations above the ground and into the user's viewpoint. And he's going to be talking on this and some related themes um, today. Thanks very much, John. I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, support from the NSF, CCLI, and DAR programs who are uh, helping me to uh, develop these uh, as teaching tools. Um, last year, by, uh, at this conference, I showed people what I thought of at the time as a hack of a way of looking at the subsurface, because geologists and geophysicists like me want to see what's under the Google Earth. And, um, so I developed a technique of basically lifting up blocks of the Earth's crust to look at what's underneath. And then the more I use this with students, the more I realize that it's actually a very useful pedagogical tool. Even if we could fly under the Google Earth surface, it would still be good for students to lift blocks up because that enables them to, s to see the data as coming from below. They, they s they've lifted the data up out of the ground themselves. That tactile element is pedagogically beneficial. So the title of my talk this year, How Would You Move Mount Fuji? According to the, uh, the author of this book uh, by William Poundstone anyway, this uh, is typical of the kind of question that you might have been asked uh, at an interview in Microsoft uh, maybe a decade ago. Bill Gates apparently liked asking people impossible, what he called the impossible question. Maybe that's so to, so it's to choose people to develop software that's impossible to use. But that's my own personal bias. But anyway, I uh, uh, thought about this question and thought a more important question really is, if you could move Mount Fuji, why on earth would you want to? Um, isn't Mount Fuji quite happy sitting there where it uh, evolved in Japan? Um, but uh, as a geologist, the answer is immediately evident, and one initial answer to that question would be to look inside the mountain, see what the interior of the mountain looks like. Um, so if we want to look inside Mount Fuji, one idea would be to lift it up and uh, look underneath. And um, I've been developing this technique to lift blocks out of the ground using SketchUp. So this is a USGS map of the Washington State region. And if we lift up a SketchUp block out of the ground, we see USGS data models anywhere on the side of this uh, block showing how the uh, Juan de Fuca plate, part of the Pacific Ocean crust, is dipping down underneath the continental crust of Washington State. And uh, letting, letting off uh, volatiles that then uh, cause the magma ascent to create mountains like Mount Rainier and uh, Mount Hood and so on. And uh, this block is a, just one of a whole set that I've developed uh, and I've put my web address in the uh, bottom left here. You can go to that link and see dozens of uh, similar blocks for different plate tectonic scenarios around, around the globe. You'll notice the time slider at the top of the uh, image here. I'm using that time slider uh, to adjust the altitude tag of, of the SketchUp model here. So when you move the time slider, you're basically changing the altitude tag in KML. And, and that's what causes the block to move up and down. So let's look at making a block like this in SketchUp. We start getting rid of the guy there and uh, pull out a rectangle, extrude that into a rectangular block. And I've, you'll notice that I extrude downwards in the negative z direction because I want my block to start under the ground. 
and then I select a couple of images. Here I'm putting a map on the surface, but you could actually grab a bit of the Google Earth surface itself and plunk it on the top of the block if you wanted to look like part of the Google Earth surface. Here I'm taking the USGS cross section, dragging it across as a texture across the side of the block in SketchUp. And then we can uh, manipulate that uh, texture, uh, expand it, scale it, rotate it, make it fit the block to suit our own needs. I have more work to do on this one here, but you get the idea. So then we save that as a, a, a KMZ file, and as I said, then go into the uh, KML and, and put a time span in the place mark that controls the block. That's the basic idea for a block. And uh, as I said, I've made lots of these. But you'll notice they have a flat or a smooth surface. Now, that's OK for the scale that we're looking at here. Say, if we were looking at Mount Fuji from space, from the space shuttle, um, we're sufficiently far away that it's only really the large scale plate tectonics we're seeing here. Things like mountains uh, aren't represented here by more than the thickness of a line, by, by a pixel or, or maybe two pixels. And so it doesn't really matter that the top of the surface, top surface of the block is, uh, is flat. The Earth is pretty flat on this scale. Um, but if we were to clo go closer up, and here's a uh, view, an oblique view of Mount Fuji from, let's say, helicopter elevation, um, at this scale, it, uh, a flat-topped block would be senseless, for, it certainly would be useless for a geologist to convey the three-dimensionality of the mountain. So how do we actually uh, put topography on the top of our, our block? So let's start by capturing some terrain in, in uh, SketchUp. So the trick here is to get real close. You have to be at an elevation of five kilometers or less, which means you might have to patch together a few little bits. You can then import that terrain into SketchUp. There it is. Bump it into a three-dimensional terrain using the SketchUp tool. And now we select it and select all and uh, explode the, uh, the hidden uh, geometry of the block so we get down to the polygons that define this topography. Now, we could actually manipulate each polygon one by one. We could create uh, erosion by moving polygons down, or, or uh, lava flow by moving them up. Or we can change the location of this block, either in altitude or, or in latitude or longitude. So here I've taken a slice out of Mount Fuji, put a a very simple student-style cartoon of the interior of the, uh, of the mountain. And, and you see that the time slider I've just set to loop forwards and backwards so that that lifts the altitude of the block up and down. And meanwhile, the student can rotate it around and look at it from all sorts of directions, can even fly inside the mountain if they want to have a look inside. And part of the project I'm working on with a colleague, Steve Whitmire at JMU, is to find out whether this kind of cartoon cross-section is actually beneficial to learning versus real data like geoseismic sections. Cartoons are simpler for students, but, but they're clearly not real. And maybe the real data might be more meaningful to students. Well, that's uh, moving the, the uh, mountain in the vertical direction. What about the lateral direction? Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to move Mount Fuji to a different location? Well, the reason we would uh, goes back to something that Charles Lyell, one of the forefathers of, of uh, geology, said in the 19th century. He said, the present is the key to the past. If we want to understand the past geology of our planet, we need to look at what's happening on the Earth's surface at present and use that as an analog. So here in this uh, movie I'm about to run, this is uh, I've taken just little chunks of the continents, put them back to where they were half a billion years ago. You see uh, Africa and South America stuck together as Gondwana in the bottom left and North America in the top center of the image. They're about to hit into each other to make a supercontinent we call Rodinia. And then they'll split apart again, 
and come together in a different orientation to make Pangaea, which is the supercontinent most people know about. So we're going way back before Pangaea here. So let's, let's roll it. And I've marked uh, Western Massachusetts in the North American block. So here they smash into each other, drift apart, create the Proto-Atlantic Ocean. And now you see a Japan-style arc drifting across that ocean and smashing into uh, North America. That's Eastern Massachusetts, which came along and hit into Western Massachusetts to create the, uh, the state that I used to live in up to last year. And, um, and so here is an ideal opportunity for us. We have, uh, just down the road from where I lived in Massachusetts, we have these uh, uh, frost-shattered lavas. They're called hyaloclastite, but you don't need to know that. They're also pillow lavas. These are ind indicative that lava flowed, bubbled into the ocean, and the frost-shattered lava shows that the, there, there was uh, ice around, that lava erupted under an, uh, an ice cap. So we have Paleozoic volcanics in an arc in eastern Massachusetts today, and the rocks indicate that they were very like Mount Fuji when they were formed. So we can now take Mount Fuji and represent these rocks uh, using, using it as a model. Now, lots of people have put paleogeographic maps on and draped them onto the Google Earth surface, uh, particularly Ron Blakey's maps have been used, and um, Valerie uh, Runasov uh, has animated them. And that's fine in two dimensions, but if you, uh, if you actually make this map semi-transparent, you look at the terrain underneath, it's the new terrain, the current elevations that are under that map, where it says, Island arc there, if you, if you pop this into three dimensions, you won't get the mountains and the, and the sea in the right place. So in addition, in addition to our paleogeography, we need a paleo terrain. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take something like Mount Fuji and replicate it in order to create a, a paleo terrain. I'm particularly interested with my colleague Steve Whitmire in the, the the uh, upper right end of this Japan-like arc because it outcrops in my home country of Ireland, in Western Ireland. And there we see Paleozoic volcanics in the image on the top right here in a place called Knock Kilbride. And those uh, rocks formed in an island arc environment. So let's take Mount Fuji and put it there. And because if volcanoes grow in a self-similar fashion, it's a simple matter to, to simulate volcanic growth by simply moving the volcano up out of the ground by changing its elevation. So here I'm taking a volcano. Actually, this one isn't Fuji. This is Sitkin Island from the Aleutians, but it'll do. And it's, uh, it's simulating what those um, Paleozoic uh, rocks in Western Ireland looked like at the time that they were, they were formed. Now, in addition to taking something like Mount Fuji, sometimes we don't want that very recognizable Fuji um, snow cap there. For example, uh, we, we might want the, the area to look more vegetated or less. Um, so we can use the match photo tool in SketchUp to drape uh, any kind of image we wish over the Fuji terrain model. And so here I've taken uh, an image of Hawaii and draped it over, over the terrain to, uh, to create a Fuji DM that would be suitable, for example, to represent an island arc uh, in the Cretaceous when it would be unlikely to have a, a snow cap on it. If we were looking at a lower Paleozoic volcano, we wouldn't want all that vegetation because it is pre-forests pre, uh, and grasses. And so we might take a, uh, a volcano from the Altiplano of Chile, for example, and, and drape it. We could also take our own geological maps. I've put on the right here a geological map that I've just sketched myself and draped it over the terrain and watch the volcanic structure grow. 
And with the Google Earth plugin, we can now control these models with, with JavaScript. So I'm rotating Mount Fuji around three independent axes here. You might say, why on earth would you want to do that? But again, geologists realize that parts of the Earth's crust get stretched and squashed and smashed and broken up. And so we want to do all sorts of things to, to uh, bits of the Earth's crust. And so I'm very excited about the possibilities of working, working with uh, JavaScript controlled models on Google Earth on, on the, uh, using the plugin. OK, here uh, I'm taking a map of the northwest part of Ireland here, restoring fault displacements so that the set slices of crust that Ireland's made up of go back to where they were in the Paleozoic and quite, you know, a quarter to a half billion years ago. And, and now we can do one extra thing here, and that is we can link those paleo places um, that uh, as they uh, existed on the Earth's surface, uh, say 400 million years ago, using what I call a back to the future place mark, we can take those places and link them to the present day evidence for that tectonic model. So uh, in the pop-up uh, pop image here, you see the, the pillow lavas, the, these volcanic rocks that uh, flowed underwater um, that we use as evidence to suggest that this place used to be a, uh, an arc. So if you like, the present DEM is key to the past DEM. And we can use samples of the present uh, terrain, move them around to, to effectively represent past landscapes. The ultimate goal beyond today's Google Earth is, is to represent the landscape at every place on Earth at every moment in the past. So for example, we can see Iceland on today's Google Earth. We'd like to see it 3 million years ago, 7 million years ago, 15 million years ago. And be able to go there, fly around, helicopter around it, just as we can with today's, with today's landscape. OK, so if you answer the question, how would you move Mount Fuji, by saying, with Google Earth and a Macintosh or a PC, and, and certainly with SketchUp, you might not get yourself a job in, in Microsoft. But on the other hand, you might get yourself a job as a research scientist in Old Dominion working with me and uh, trying to change Google, the Google Earth. Thanks very much. Yes. The standard way I think I would explain it, you know, as a graduate, if you use static cartoons of, of what you've said, have you got any plans to, to test the efficiency of, of what, you're, what you're doing, your, your animation against sort of standard paper cartoon uh, representation of volcanoes? OK, the question is, um, as I understand it, have we plans to test the efficiency of of our animations and our, our moving images versus static cartoons? And the answer is yes, we, we, we have a cohort of colleagues lined up to test our blocks and our, our uh, uh, paleo terrains in sections of large intro classes. And we'll have other sections of those classes that use uh, the classical methods in order to make those comparisons. We're also using logging software uh, to t check what the students are doing, how they are using the materials to, to, to learn. Okay.